Okay, well, we're getting ready now. We're looking at uh, Ludovic Lindsay there, the pole sitter for the Rotman's historic Grand Prix in that magnificent Maserati 250F. Turning back the pages in the chapter of time here at Phoenix Park for an absolutely glorious, nostalgic look at Grand Prix racing of yesteryear. And believe it or not, this is just the warm-up lap of the Rothman's historic Grand Prix. On my left is Colin Doherty, will be my fellow commentator. And on my right, Damon Hill, who is sitting here, the absolute wide mouth, I think, at the sights and sounds that we're looking even on the warm-up lap, Damon. Well, it's pretty astonishing, isn't it, that these cars are uh, difficult to remember that these cars used to be the state of the art uh, uh, when they came out sort of 50, 50 or more years ago. Well, that's it. And I mean, to me, this is just heaven. We are looking at uh, the cars racing down towards Dublin Crystal Corner now. That was the situation on the grid. Ludovic Kennedy will take up pole position. Yeah, that's Ludovic Lindsay in the glorious Maserati 250F. Uh, we had a fantastic race here yesterday, from, and uh, the Maseratis, the Maseratis, very much the stars of the show here. It's a, it's a really a glorious sight. The uh, Historic Grand Prix Car Association have brought a grid of 26 cars over here, and quite honestly, this is probably the most valuable grid of cars that has ever been seen in Phoenix Park. And you're looking at the two Maserati 250Fs, those really are one of the most beautiful motor cars ever built. Uh, the glorious red of Italy, and those were the days when, of course, Italian design and Italian motor racing was absolutely top of the list. And they're trying to fight back very hard at the moment, as you very well know, Damon. Uh, the Ferrari is still having its troubles, and uh, even out on the grass verge as they battle as they come up now towards Lynx Corner. And this is serious motor racing, Damon. Well, they seem to be going for it, I, I wouldn't believe. I mean, there's, there's, they're racing very valuable racing cars here. I'm quite surprised to see them uh, putting it all over the dirt and, and sliding it the way they are. Yeah, absolutely right. We're actually watching here a one and a half million pound dice for the lead. These Maserati 250Fs now changing hands for almost three quarter of a million pounds. And there we have in the lead, just as we had yesterday for a moment in time, uh, the German driver in the car number 26, no, sorry, it's uh, Lindsay. Yeah, it's Burkhard von Schenk from Germany uh, leading this race now in his Maserati from Ludovic Lindsay in a similar car. And the piling through the Dublin corner, you really get uh, different groups and different eras. So we'll try and uh, catch up with that. But looking at the battle up front, the two 250F Maseratis really battling it out and holding on in there, the ERA. And that's quite amazing because it comes from a period way, way before the Maserati. Yeah, that's a remarkable performance there. The third place man, David Morris, in the ERA. It's a car from 1936, so it's more than 20 years older than the Maseratis and certainly not in the same level of technology as, as the Maseratis. They are the Cooper Bristols. Uh, they're having their own little private battle going round uh, the Magnum Ferry Glen corner and you can see that it is a motor racing of a very, very different era, Damon. You really could see the driver battling away all arms and elbows, whereas you're pretty well tucked away in your survival capsule these days. Yeah, we're much more protected uh, within the cockpit these days, but mostly that's because of aerodynamic reasons. Uh, the, uh, the cockpit area is a, a big loss in performance, so they try to make the cockpit opening as small as possible on our Formula 1 cars, but in those days they weren't quite as sophisticated with their aerodynamics. 
And look at this battle between the two, two 50Fs. It's still uh, Bernard von Schenk from uh, Germany just about leading as they head out into the country that time uh, from Lindsay, and it's uh, Ludovic Lindsay, the son, incidentally, of Sir Patrick Lindsay, who used to drive this car with tremendous verve and style as he ups it and locked it round the circuits of England. And there, he's just gone into the lead. Yeah, an incredible dice here. These guys are not hanging around here. The only cars quicker this weekend at Phoenix Park are the Formula Opel and the Formula Ford. So look at that drifting, beautiful four-wheel drift through Furry Glen. What spectacular stuff. And he's been left a little bit now, the German driver, as uh, Ludovic uh, seems to get that little bit of advantage as he comes up the next corner. But really, the ERA, this is tremendous stuff indeed. Trying to hold on, and aerodynamics, I mean, you can just see the frontal area of that ERA. It seems to tar above the other two cars. Well, I've actually driven an ERA myself, and uh, I thought I was driving a 100 mile an hour tractor. It's, uh, it's, the engineering on it is pretty crude by modern standards. And uh, you can see the wheels, when he brakes, you can see the wheels, the front wheels pattering about the place. The, the, the damping's not very good. You can see the left front wheel is jumping up and down like crazy. But in those days, then he had, uh, they only had uh, friction damping and not hydraulic damping, and so um, the ride is very uncomfortable. Yeah. Tr uh, tremendously physical cars to drive. Uh, you see that the drivers have very, very upright seating position. They're sitting on top of an enormous transmission tunnel. And the extraordinary thing is, in the Maseratis, that the pedals are divided. You have the clutch pedal on the one side of the transmission tunnel and the brake and the accelerator on the other. So I think uh, left foot braking will be absolutely out of the question. And we're talking about 1936 for the ERA compared to 1953 for the Maseratis. So it really doesn't add up too well. No, it's an extraordinary performance now from uh, Dave Morrison, the little ERA. He's beginning to lose touch a little bit now with the Maseratis, but I mean, an, a fantastic drive. The car is dancing all over the place. And really, at times, I have to say, he looks like he's on the verge of absolute disaster plum. Yes, his name, of course, is David Morris. His father used to race this car also. Now we're dropping back into the faster of the Cooper Bristols there. It's car number 17 just coming into sight. Alan Miles from Dorset. It's a Mark II Cooper Bristol from 1953. And these were really the cars that were used by the privateers in Grand Prix racing. And of course, Damon, that day has long gone. Well, yes, I mean, you have to be a pretty wealthy privateer to enter Grand Prix racing these days. And I think. Uh, Anyone that wealthy would be, uh, be pretty averse to spending even that amount of money. We're looking at, and to drive or run a team nowadays, we're looking at the minimum of $20 million to run a Formula One car. And we're looking at Gregor Fiskin in the 1953 Cooper Bristol, and of course, the Cooper Bristol, probably the most famous man to drive these cars was Mike Hawthorne. And the great Mike Hawthorne, of course, the man who came to this very circuit and indeed gave his name to a version of this circuit here in Phoenix Park. So. Look at this, this is real variety. The faster men now threading their way through the tail markers. See the ERA in third place, just going past the Alfa Romeo. And here they come thundering around the big Lagonda. And we have our German friend back in the lead. That he must have got mixed up in the back markers. So it's a problem that stood with us in motor racing for many years. But it'd be interesting to see how this German coach with traffic. <laughs> yes, the other one does quite well. Yes, well, the leaders now lapping the back markers there, the Alfa Romeos from the 1930s, as Brum was saying. And the extraordinary thing is that one of those Alfa Romeos actually has a tow hitch on the back of it. Uh, Terry Cohn uses the Alfa to tow his caravan to race meetings. And Lindsay's gone back into the lead again as they go down into Dublin Crystal Corner and they're really putting on a tremendous fight. They've got a clear track ahead of them now. The race has been shortened a little bit as we're running out of time here a bit at Phoenix Park. But I think uh, there was an overtaking manoeuvre again as we go down into Ferry Glen. So Von uh, Schenk looks like he's back in the lead. There's one of the few uh, local drivers waving the quicker man past in his Alfa Romeo. That's uh, Johnston from the north of Ireland. Here they are, battling again as they come down into Magnum Ferry Glen. Number 21 in the lead, that's uh, Berhard von Schenk in the 250F Maserati, dating back to 1956. Just one of the things that they can do, these cars, uh, are, are on the old, the old cars, is they can get close to each other in a corner because they don't actually generate a lot of their grip from, down, from aerodynamic downforce. In fact, they don't get any aerodynamic downforce, it's all mechanical, so they're able to get very close to each other, which makes the racing very exciting. 
Benefit Lindsay looking very threatening there in second place. But Damon, do you think when you watch this, I mean, it's hugely entertaining, make great noises, they're fighting with the cars, we can see the drivers in them and say overtaking is quite possible. Do you think we've gone backwards in some respects in Grand Prix racing? Well, uh, the guy in uh, the number 26 car is certainly not going backwards, he's now taking the lead again. <laughs> but you know what I mean, in entertainment states, sometimes uh, the problem with the modern Grand Prix car is, as you say, you can't overtake. It's more difficult, yes, I must admit, and I think uh, it would be interesting if we could generate racing whereby cars can get close to each other again in corners. Well, certainly the Maserati 250Fs are dominating this uh, Rotman's historic Grand Prix today. And uh, what an amazing sight. I mean, Ludovic Lindsay now leading Burkhard von Schenk. But these guys are dicing wheel to wheel, and this is very, very serious stuff. And when I see 250F Maseratis, it really, and look at that for opposite lock. Absolutely, as I say in this part of the world, the full of the rack. Well, it's nice to see. Um, I think, uh, the real, real joy of watching these cars is watching them slide around, and uh, we don't see that much in modern Grand Prix racing. The, the tyres they have on here are just treaded, pretty hard old things. They're treaded tyres and can take a bit of uh, abuse. And this is far from over because Von uh, Schenk is uh, really putting on uh, quite a battle as they come up the main straight now. And we're on the last lap, looking for the checkered flag now, and it looks like uh, Ludovic Lindsay could be his race. Ludovic Lindsay coming down into the breaking distance there in a Dublin Crystal corner. He's only got three corners to do it now. The German, if he's going to really uh, snatch victory. And out they go out in the countryside once again, down the Rathdrum Motors. And there is Andy, uh, Andy Johnson there, bouncing around in the Alfa Romeos. And some tremendous history on these motor cars. Picking up number five there. They really are all original factory cars virtually. That's James Lindsay from London. That's a 1933 car. And here they are lapping at the Alfa Romeo's guys that come down into Ferry Glen. Yes, well, this dice is up and down the field here, Plum. There are no less than eight classes of cars here, so everyone who's out there today is having a dice with somebody else in a car of a similar vintage and I think having a great deal of fun. So any bets, Damon, who's it going to be? Which one of these two Maseratis? Well, I wouldn't like to put any money in it at the moment. It's been changing every lap. David Morris still there in third place, just behind a back marker. It's a 1936 car. In fact, the car that won the Court Grand Prix in 1936. Yes, well, they're onto the main straight now for the last time, and looking for the chequered flag. Thank you, partner. Sorry your last lap. And it's Ludovic Lindsay still in the lead here, but for Burkhard von Schenk putting Ludovic under tremendous pressure here. He has the inside line now for Dublin Crystal Corner, and he holds it beautifully under braking. The extraordinary thing to bear in mind here, as we watch Ludovic Lindsay getting it sideways, is that these cars have drum brakes all round. There are only two cars out in this field that actually have disc brakes. And I think uh, you could have called that to Damon a bag full of neutrals there for a while. They couldn't seem to find gear. Yeah, it didn't look like the, uh, the driver in number 26 car was having trouble getting gears. Uh, of course, it's a lot more difficult to change gear on these cars, and uh, that was part of the skill of a driver in the old days, was to look after the machinery. The other thing that is a, a little bit uncomfortable is that the transmission of these motor cars runs right down between your legs, uh, so you wouldn't want anything to go wrong with that. Now, who's going to do it? Uh, really get the feeling that these two are putting on a tremendous show for us. You're looking at literally millions of pounds worth of motor cars that they're playing with. They're coming up side by side into Link's Corner. And uh, this is exactly the, the show that they put on yesterday for the enormous crowds here at Phoenix Park. And it's a two-horse race, but what a race. Damon, are you enjoying this? I've really enjoyed it. It's very, very exciting watching the cars sliding around. I guess uh, you're not going to know exactly who's, uh, who's, who's going to cross the line first. Is that the last lap there? Oh, and he's gone. Lindsay's gone. And nearly Van Schenk as well. And surely the ERA now is through to second place. So I'm afraid, Damon, it's going to be another Grand Prix victory uh, for a German. <laughs> well, at least it's not the, uh, the other German. Right, out he goes into the countryside, a little bit chastened, I would imagine, for his experience. Well, my goodness, here we see a replay now, and uh, Ludovic Lindsay beginning to put uh, Burkhardt von Schenk under a lot of pressure, but as you see, Burkhardt totally overshot, and then Ludovic spins, getting very oily down there, I think, at Dublin Crystal Corner.
and an enormous great block of flaps of a, a Laconda went through him around the outside there. He was lucky he didn't make contact with that. So here comes uh, the likely winner, all on his own now. We can't even see the ERA in the background. So Burkhardt, who was runner-up yesterday, looks like he's going to win the Rothmans Historic Grand Prix here today at Phoenix Park as it comes down to the right-hander that takes him onto the main straight again. And he's still fighting away a little bit more gently, a bit of a slide as he comes out of the main straight. Uh, any desire to drive one of these machines, Damon? Well, they look beautiful, don't they? I must say, it's, uh, they, they do look uncomfortable. They bounce around a lot. Like, they used to wear kidney belts, you know, all the time, because otherwise their kidneys would start bleeding. Well, maybe this is not over yet because uh, we're looking to see just how far back Lindsay is. He's bound to be probably the fastest man uh, on the circuit and once again he's spun it at Dublin Corner. So Lindsay's really dropped out of it now and I'm afraid uh, that's it for his race. Uh, we say goodbye to Diane Damon and thank him very much for joining us as he's a very, very packed schedule. And meanwhile, the winner is treading his way up through more Bach Barkers. Well, what a wonderful moment now for Burkhard von Schenk. He's travelled all the way from Germany. This is his first time to see this track in Phoenix Park. It's a really awesome track and, of course, in many ways, a track that's well suited to these type of cars. But what a fantastic performance. He's lapping some of the back markers now. Look at that, a wheel on the grass in a three-quarter of a million pound car. He's not afraid of this machine. One of those Alphas, incidentally, car number five, driven by James Lindsay, has a tremendous Irish record. It won the 1935 Limerick Grand Prix, was runner-up in the County Town Trophy in 36, and the Cork Grand Prix in 37 and 38. But Ludovic Lindsay all crossed up there, arriving onto the main straight. And, uh, but it looks like Burkhard von Chaitz takes the very first Rothmans historic Grand Prix. And Lindsay somehow managed to get back into second place and surely he had the fastest lap uh, and those closing laps uh, after his mistake. Meanwhile, the, one of the Cooper Bristols coming up uh, to take the chequered flag. And in third place, it was the ERA. Fifth, fourth was Miles, the first of the Cooper Bristols. And fifth, Fisher, I think, number 16. Yes, uh, in another one of the Mark II Cooper Bristols dating back to 1953. So extraordinary. What a good match. Some of these cars were yet uh, separated by an enormous distance in years. Of course, there were wars and things in between. <laughs> Well, what a wonderful show they put on Plum and really you have to congratulate the Irish Motor Racing Club and the Leinster Motor Club for, for making the efforts to persuade the Historic Grand Prix Car Association to bring over this grid of cars. They really are mouth-watering. And the huge crowds uh, really enjoying. I see a good few grandfathers and grandmothers in the crowd there probably having a very intimate knowledge of these cars in their heyday. Burkhard von Schenk, congratulations, a wonderful historic Grand Prix there. That was quite a dice you had with uh, Ludovic Lindsay. Yes, and it was all around the track on almost 12 laps. And regrettably, he lost it on, I think, the third la last lap at the corner there. And so I was on my own. I was not going to slow down for that so that we could continue the dice. Um, it was a great race, as we had it yesterday. There, the roles were reversed. He was first, I was second. So is this weekend the first time you've driven at the Phoenix Park? Yes, and I hope it was not the last time. So you obviously enjoyed the circuit, but it's Thoroughly. quite challenging. Well, it is challenging. It's hard on the cars, but uh, I think with these numbers of laps, we can do it. And um, so far, the cars stood the course. No? What's the history of your Maserati? This one was uh, a team car driven by Bera in 56. Regrettably, he had uh, Fangio and Moss always ahead of him. So he in five, I think it was in five Grand Prix, he came always in third. So it never, wa it never won that year, but five times third isn't bad either. You know? But you're obviously very happy with the performance of it this afternoon. Yes, certainly. Mercar, congratulations. Well done once again. I'll hand you, you over now to John Daly, Marketing Director with uh, Rothmans. He's going to make the presentations. So John Daly steps up into the rostrum for the historic Grand Prix, uh, which goes to Germany and, of course, to Maserati, both in first and second place. Uh, Kennedy, uh, sorry, Lindsay, Ludovic uh, Lindsay in second place. A uh, very, very famous historic racing family. As I said uh, in the commentary, his father used to be a great racing driver. There he is. And uh, he's handed down the Maserati to his son, who handles it, as we said, admirably. 
So in second place, then in third place, the ERN. Possibly uh, David Morris's performance uh, was maybe the ho most heroic of them all. And then the first of the Cooper Bristols, home in fourth place, Miles.